Dream Company invites you by transcription to join the chase. There's always the hunter and the hunted, the pursuer and the pursued. It may be the voice of authority or a race with death and destruction, the most relentless of the hunters. There are times when laughter is heard as counterpoint and moments when sheer terror is the theme. But always there is the chase. Let me brief you first before I spin the yarn. You'll say I'm a liar in 16 different languages unless you're familiar with the dossier. The name is Decker, Larry Decker. You may have seen it on a couple of books. Red Tide was one of them. It gave me the distinction of being persona non grata in the Soviet Union as an accredited foreign correspondent. I was transferred from Moscow to the Paris office of the New York paper I was working for, and while I sunned my torso at a bullmish cafe table, I wrote a couple of pot boilers and waited for another assignment. Larry, comment ça va? Ah, très bien, mon ami, très bien. Sit down, have a beer, Paul. I hear you'll be on the move again. Oh? Says who? McCall's assigning you to another spot. He mentioned it to me at the office this morning. Oh, I didn't check in this AM. I better call him. You don't think it's an eastern spot? Oh, the office wouldn't ship you behind the curtain. Not after that blast you got from the commies. I think you're slated for Nuremberg. Mm, good enough. Tired of Paris? I'm tired of doing nothing the easy way, maybe. <laughs> Here's one reporter who'd stay here forever if they let him. Ah, uh, Paris. Les femmes, les champagnes. Rugged is the word for it. <laughs> hey, Larry. Yeah. See that dark guy over there just sitting down? What about him? That's Raslov. The Russian? Boris Mekhanov's chief cook and bottle washer. He's no GPU matter. Postgraduate student. They say he'd crown his own grandmother with a bottle of vodka if she didn't join the party. Is Mekhanov in town, Paul? Came here yesterday with a delegation for the international conference. Mm, it's a pretty big cookie behind the Iron Curtain. First time he's even been west. They say he's slated for one of the biggest chairs in Poland. Commissar of communications and double talk or something like that. He's making a speech today at the Palais. Going to dish out the same tired old gravy, I suppose. Larry, who do they think they're kidding? Oh, themselves, maybe. When they stink up the airwaves, do they really think anyone believes it? If you're one of the enlightened in their domain, you better believe it. Or else. What time does he make this speech? Around four this afternoon. I think I'll run over to the Palais and listen. It's always good for a laugh. He's, uh, he's looking our way. Hmm, Rosloff? May have overheard us. Yeah, so he's in Paris now, not Minsk. You can open your mouth here. Well, I'd better get. I got a date at three. May see you at the Palais later. I'll be there, sweetie pie, enjoying the yaks. But it wasn't funny. Their speeches may sound funny, but they're sad, friend. And as I listened to Mekhanov's varsity dragged, I got the feeling I always get. This was where I came in. Peoples of the Soviet Union and their friends and allies want only peace. That is their greatest ambition. Like in Korea. We and we alone know the meaning of freedom, which we practice religiously. In a pig's it eye. Is in the West, where you will find slavery. Slavery to capitalism. Slavery to bourgeois decadence. I mean, slavery to the And so it went on and on and on like a broken record. The words came out with the sameness of beer cans on a production line. They sounded just as hollow. Mekhanov had been a college professor before the Kremlin yanked him upstairs. Surely he must have some intelligence. Would it be possible that he believed those worn-out gag routines? Well, I was still debating this question with myself when Paul Courtney saw me off at one of the railway stations of Paris... I was on my way to Nuremberg, Germany. Well, don't work too much, Larry. I'll try hard not to. How's your German? It uh, needs a little sauerkraut and pilsner, but I'll get by. <laughs> well, drop me a line. I... Hey, what's up? 
Look who you're getting as a traveling companion. Mm, who? Isn't that Mekinoff and his entourage over there, just boarding the train? Huh? Well, I'll be... Sure, they'll be in my car. He's probably on his way to Czechoslovakia by way of Nuremberg. He's got a mob with him. As Roslov, and a bodyguard. They'll probably lock themselves inside a compartment until they hit the Soviet zone. You know, I'd like to talk to him. Mekinoff? Yes. <laughs> well, what do you talk about, the weather? It's about all you'll have in common. I'd like to ask him if he really means those speeches he makes. If any of the big shots mean them. I'd like to get an off-the-record version. Oh, you've got a fat chance. So I can try. Larry, you're joking. Joking? Don't be silly. He's supposed to be an intelligent man in spite of those lying platitudes he keeps throwing around. Maybe I can goad him into admitting it's all malarkey. Listen, Larry. Oh, I gotta run. I'll see you. Larry, that's a dangerous crew. Be careful, Larry. Be careful. Paul didn't have to warn me. I knew the score, or so I thought. But if I had really had the faintest notion of what I was getting into, I might have thought twice before sticking out my one and only neck. My wagon lit bedroom compartment was only too removed from the special section that had been set aside for Mekinoff and his crew. And I knew I didn't have a chance of even getting in to see him until he was alone. So I opened my bedroom door and waited for five solid hours. There were four of them besides the boss, and three of them left before midnight and moseyed into their own compartments to get some sleep. Only Rasloff was with him now. And just as I started to get a little sleepy, I heard the compartment door open once again, and I peered out. And it was Rasloff, all right. He was moving toward the end of the train with his back toward me. As he left the car, going to the diner, maybe, for a good night snack, I walked up to Mekinoff's section, hesitated, then raised my hand and knocked. Mr. Mekinoff? No. Uh. Look, my Russian is kind of creaky. You speak English, don't you? Who are you? Decker is my name. What do you want? I just dropped in to ask you a simple question. Well... That speech you made in Paris the other day, Mr. Mekinoff. Do you or do you not believe that it was true? I want an off-the-record answer, if you've got the courage. I'll admit the approach was as subtle as a kick in the teeth, but I'd gauged it that way. I thought I might startle him into a slip of the tongue, but no such thing happened. He just stared at me. At me and through me. It was then I began to notice the sickly green pallor that was rising in his jowly face. Mr. Mekinoff. Uh, did you hear my question? Yes, I hear the question. I will answer it. Sit down. Are you feeling all right? In a very few moments, my impetuous friend, it will not matter. What? You ask me a question. Here is my answer. The speech was a lie from beginning to end. I may as well tell you, Mr. Mekinoff, that I'm going to quote you. Quote me? <laughs> you can do better. I have a signed statement here. Perhaps if I give it to you, it may see the light of day. I don't understand. Never have we believed what we said. We are not fools, my friend. Our words are for this stupid little man who is not allowed to think for himself. You sound like a guy who's just discovered he's got a conscience. You sound like a schoolboy, not a correspondent. You think I'm telling you all this because I love your West any more than I love my own country? I would have gone on if they let me. But when one is a thief, he should learn he cannot trust other thieves. Then you had a falling out with the Kremlin? Yesterday they executed my wife in Moscow. Eugenie, my wonderful Eugenie. And for what? For what, I ask you? Was she a traitor? No. Did she follow the common foreign policies? Yes. Then why did she have to die? Why? I'll tell you why she dared to think for herself for one brief moment. Yes, my friend, 30 years of glory mean nothing if you deviate for one brief moment. 
Well, what'll happen to you when you get back? When I get back? You think I am mad enough to return? But this train will only arrive with my body, my friend. Only my body. He toppled over from his seat and lay still. Slowly his hand opened and a small vial rolled out of his fingers. He must have taken the poison before I came in. And it was obvious that Mr. Mekinoff had just turned in his party card, but for good. I slipped the paper he'd handed me into my pocket, then opened the compartment door. My luck was still with me because the corridor was empty. I darted back toward the rear of the car to the safety of my own room. I opened the paper, and I read it carefully. It was written in Russian. I could still get the gist of it. It was an admission to the world and an accusation, pure and simple. And coming from one of the topmost figures in the Communist Party, when it was published, it would hold up the hypocrisy of the party line for the whole world to ridicule. And suddenly I remembered. I'd left my hat in Mackinac's compartment. <laughs> Oh, excuse me. What do you want? I, I, I must have the wrong compartment. Oh? Well, I, I mean... What are you looking for? Oh, nothing. Sorry. Good night. It was only ten minutes since I'd left Mekhanov's body, but it was gone when I stuck my head back inside. Only Raslov was there turning my hat around slowly in his hands. The hat with my initials on the sweat man. I returned to my compartment, locked the door, and sat down to think. Now, there was still a chance that they wouldn't connect me with the guy who owned the hat, but that chance was a slim one. One thing was certain. They didn't want it known that Mekhanov had committed suicide. That's why they hid his body so fast. And if they found out I had his signed statement, my life wouldn't be worth two rubles. I had to get off that train while it was still in Western territory, or be carried off, feet first. I, uh. Who is it? Le bien, monsieur, s'il vous plaît. Merci, monsieur. Allez-vous, Anglais? Un peu, monsieur. When is the next stop? The next step, monsieur, five minutes. All right, now listen. A man has just killed himself aboard this train. Monsieur. Mekinov, the Russian diplomat. He's committed suicide. This man is a troublemaker. Oh, monsieur Raslov. He is a reporter trying to get an interview with monsieur Mekinov. You were told, were you not, that our party was to have complete privacy aboard this train. Oui, monsieur. When we asked for diplomatic protection against pests, we included Americans. Uh. Pardon, monsieur. Uh, monsieur, you are a reporter, as monsieur Rosloff says. Yes, I am, Enough, but I... Monsieur, you will please be very careful to mind your own affairs. Monsieur Mekinoff and his party have diplomatic protection. I have been told... All right, all right, keep your shirt on. You may go, conductor. I will give this rash young man an interview and satisfy his curiosity. Monsieur. Well, you boys are fast on the upbeat. This is your hat, I presume? I suppose we may as well take our hair down. We seem to be pretty familiar with each other now. Obviously. What'd you do with the body? What body? Now, let's not play footsie, Raslov. You have obviously been drinking, monsieur. Oh, yes, the water in that carafe outside's a hundred proof. Well, looks as though this is my stop, Raslov. You are leaving us? If you don't mind. But I do. I mind enough to blow your head off if you attempt to leave this compartment. Nice ride you've got there. German Luger, isn't it? Looks like a pre-war model. Sit down and be quiet. You will remain in that seat until this train has left the station. And then what? Then we will decide exactly what to do with you. So I had two choices. I could either make a run for it and get a bullet in the back of my head, 
Or I could sit there and wait for him to put a bullet in the front. If murder wasn't his specialty, at least it was a hobby with this character. And as he smiled and smoked and smoked and smiled, his finger fondled the gun trigger like a jeweler caressing an 18-carat diamond. But what are you waiting for? I beg your pardon. We've left the station. When does target practice begin? What did Mikhanov tell you just before he died? He said the Dodgers will absolutely bag the series. Uh, just wait till next year. What? Next question. You are in a dangerous situation, my friend. So you're telling me... I am beginning to feel sorry for you. Oh, thanks. When a diplomat of Mr. Mekhanov's standing is found murdered in his compartment... Murdered? Oh, relax, Rasloff. Your dialectic materialism is showing. I beg your Mekhanov pardon. Mekhanov killed himself with a dose of poison that would have put away a horse. I beg your pardon. He was murdered. By you. By which? This is your hat, is it not? So what? It was found near the body. It is unmistakable evidence of your guilt. You know, you better lay off the Bosch, Junior. It's going to your head. Why should I kill Mekhanov? Where's my motive? You wish to rob him. Of what? This sum of money I have here. Three million French francs. You mean the sum of money you just pulled out of your own pocket? You know, a plant like that would be laughed out of any court in the world except... Except one in Moscow. Is that what you are going to say? We're a long way from Moscow now, Raslov. But only a short way from the Czech frontier. I give you my word, my friend, that you will be given a fair and most interesting trial when we arrive. Sound incredible? Well, it didn't to me. This cookie had it all worked out. And I was sure he'd even arrange for me to make a full confession of the crime. Oh, it was a neat package with all the edges trimmed. It would save them the embarrassment of even the hint of suspicion that Mekhanov killed himself to avoid going back to the promised land. You keeping me company for the night, Rasloff? With your permission. Well, take the upper berth. Maybe you'll fall out of it and break your neck. We will be at Nuremberg in the morning. From there, it is only a short time until we reach the Czech frontier. Haven't you overlooked something? So? The German customs guard will inspect this compartment when we reach the Franco-German frontier. My party has diplomatic immunity, my friend. No one will bother to question us. In as much as you will be included on our diplomatic list... Score one for your side. Yes. Well, I'll be in there pitching, chum. Right to the end of the game. <laughs> We settled down, facing each other across the room, and the hours ticked by. We got past the Franco-German frontier, just as he'd said. No one even troubling to knock on my compartment door, and I knew he had his cronies outside, well briefed. The next stop was Nuremberg, the last before the Czech frontier, and I had to make my move by then, or lose my chips. Sleepy, Rosloff? I'm wide awake, my friend. How about a cup of coffee? Breakfast can wait. You know, I haven't had anything under my belt since yesterday afternoon. I'm... You will find it good for the figure. Why don't you sit a little closer, Rasloff? It's cozier. I am comfortable where I am. Just an arm and revolver length away from your heart. Want to make a bargain? With you? Yeah. Set me free, and I'll hand you a very interesting paper. Oh? Signed by Mekhanov himself. Is this some kind of a bluff, my friend? It's right here in my pocket. A complete expose of what you call your people's republic. Mekhanov signed it before he died. Very interesting. Well, come on over here and take it and set me free. I'll take it, my friend, but as far as you are concerned... <coughs> waiting all night to get him close enough so I could land a left hook. And in his anxiety for that paper, he dropped his guard for just a moment. As I connected, I ducked, and his bullet hit the wall. Two seconds later, I was tearing down the corridor toward the front, the car. I didn't know where I was running because the train was going too fast to allow me to make a jump. 
All I knew was that the winner of this chase got my head as a trophy, and I was anxious to keep it right where it was, on top of my neck. It was four in the morning. Everybody on board the train was asleep. Everyone it is except... Rasloff's bodyguards behind me, firing away like a hillbilly on a turkey shoot. There was only one thing to do, so I did it. I reached the next car. I ducked into the nearest compartment, out of sight. Well, I declare. Excuse me, ma'am. How dare you come into this here compartment uninvited? Shh, for the love of Mike, lady, will you please be quiet? Quiet? Where I come from, you'd be roped like a steer, young man, for walking into a lady's boudoir this way. Why, it's a good thing I was dressed to get off at Nuremberg. Well, I never saw the likes of... Shh! Look, ma'am, my life depends on you. I'm an American. I'm running away from a communist killer. If you tell him I'm in here, I'm finished. Who's there? We are looking for a thief, madam. A dangerous man. Are you alone in your compartment? Well, of course I'm alone. Are you sure? Are you calling me a liar? Why, if my husband were here, he'd slap your sassy face. Excuse me, madam. Excuse me. He's gone. <sighs> Thanks a lot. Now, what's going on here? Are you from Texas? Naturally. My mother came from Texas. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place, young man? Look, lady, I've got to get off this train at Nuremberg. Or my life isn't worth a cent. Now, maybe you can help me. How? Will you lend me some clothes? My clothes? Just a dress, a veil, and a hat, if you've got them. I think I can sneak across the Nuremberg station without being shot at. You mean they're shooting at you, too? Well, it's open season on Americans out there in the corridor, but don't worry, they never shoot tourists in Europe. What is this? Uh, my night robe. Now, wait a sec. I'll see if I can find you something to wear in my suitcase. Well, look, hurry, will you? We're due in Nuremberg any minute now. We have... Hey! Well, what's the matter? Riding right through Nuremberg Station. We are? We're not stopping here. This train is going right onto the Czech frontier. But my ticket says Nuremberg. We got to stop. Now wait. Wait right here. W where are you going, young man? Somebody has pulled a fast one. I'm going out to investigate. And thanks a lot for your help, Miss or Mrs. Uh... Yeah, you just call me Hortense. And good luck to you. I poked my head out of the corridor and found it empty. I was just three cars from the engine now, and as I walked forward, I would have given every cent I owned to have an extra set of eyes in the back of my skull, but they must have been looking for me in the rear of the train because I did okay until I reached the baggage car. And then the train lurched, and I swung sideways against what I thought was a tied-up duffel bag until I heard a groan, and I saw it was the conductor. Holy smoke. All right, take it easy. Take it easy, Alphonse. I'll get you out of here. Just a minute. There. Good. Yes. What happened? They hit my head and tied me, monsieur. This is an outrage. Right, where are they? Two of them are forward, running the engine, monsieur. They've also knocked out the engineers. Well, that means they've got complete control of this train. And they're going to try and ride it across the Czech frontier with all passengers. Look behind you, monsieur, in back of the trunk. Huh? Oh, it's knocking off. They carried him in here, huh? I owe you the apologies, monsieur, if I had known. All right, all right, never mind that now. We have to work fast. They are all armed, monsieur. They would shoot us down if we ever showed our heads near the engine. There are four of them all together, two up front, two behind. How long before we reach the Czech frontier? Oh, not that we are past Nuremberg, monsieur, very soon. Wait a minute, Levin. Somebody's coming. Monsieur, be quiet. Comment se va, monsieur le conducteur? Avez-vous... We're looking for the loop, monsieur. I was hoping that it'd be Rasloff, but it's one of his stooges. All right, start tying him up good and tight. Where are you going, monsieur? Meet me in the rear of the train just as soon as you trust this guy. Now, Rasloff is alone back there, which makes it a little more even. He's been on my tail up to now. I think it's just about time I started chasing him. I made my way slowly toward the rear of the train, watching every vestibule and compartment door. I had a plan in mind, but it wouldn't work until I got hold of Rasloff and his gun. As I passed through the car in which the Texas gal had her compartment, I noticed her door was open. I stopped. And I stepped inside and saw her standing against the window, staring at me with worried eyes. Don't come in. Don't... Please do. Oh, I tried to warn you. He come in here with his gun just a minute ago and, and hid behind the door. It's all right, Hortense. I just as soon have it his way. First of all, you will give me that paper signed by my colleague, my friend. Sure, I'll give it to you. Only this time you will put it over there, on the windowsill. Right now what? 
Now we will complete some unfinished business. Well, what's he going to do? Carry me into Russian territory for another one of their phony trials. On the contrary. I have decided that he's too much of a nuisance. Oh, really? I will save my country the time and expense and try you myself right here. I, Andrei Raslov, find you guilty of murder, and I sentence you to immediate execution. Why, that's preposterous. Oh, no, that's par for the course, where he comes from. Turn around. What about the lady? Never mind the lady, turn. No, no, you couldn't. Shoot! Ah! Just as he raised his gun to fire, the conductor showed up near the open door. Raslov's eyes wavered for just a second, and that was all the time I needed. I... He... He fired as I kicked his gun hand, then he was on me in a flash, with his hands on my throat and his thumbs pushing holes in my Adam's apple. I could feel my windpipe beginning to snap like a reed while he choked the breath back into my lungs, and then just when I thought I'd had it, I raised my knee as hard as I could and planted it square in his middle. Uh, uh, All right, head, help him to his feet. I've got his gun. Up, monsieur. In, in three minutes, the train will be across the frontier, my friend. There is nothing you can do to stop him. No, drag him out of the corridor and quick. Outside, monsieur. Take him to the vestibule at the end of the car. Beat, monsieur Haslow, beat. All right, open the door. <laughs> ah, conductor, oui. you know how to uncouple this train? Uncouple the train? Yeah. Monsieur day, if we separate this car from the engine, they go on without us. Don't touch that. Ah. <laughs> One more crack out of you and I'll break your head wide open. All right, conductor, work fast. It is not too easy. All right, the border, we're coming to the frontier. I can see the stanchions up ahead, and I'll make it snappy. Hi, monsieur. I, I will be out. Ah, ah, there. The trench is all ready to speak. Hold it a second. I'll take that signed statement, Rasloff. Ah. Yes, thank you very kindly. And now you can join your pals in the front section. Au revoir. The coupling is broken, monsieur. We are free. Well, there's the story. Headline, lead, and payoff. But it won't be published. Why? Uh, because they've got a new guy in there. A substitute. The peoples of the Soviet Union want peace. We alone know the meaning of freedom. It is in the West. Where you will find... He looks like Mekinoff. He calls himself Mekinoff. He sounds like Mekinoff. And he mouths the same farina. They deny that Mekinoff is dead. Only I know better. But maybe I'll have a chance to publish my yarn when Mekinoff number two decides to swallow poison. The Chase was created and written for the National Broadcasting Company by Lawrence Clee. Featured in tonight's cast were John Larkin, Leon Janney, Roger DeCoven, Ruth York, and Bill Quinn. The Chase is directed and transcribed by Edward King, Fred Collins speaking. Next week, a telephone call that stretches between life and death when we present Long Distance on The Chase. Tonight, enjoy Counter Spy and Barry Craig on NBC.